You are listening to the Savage Fincast, episode 119, Vibrant Colors, Muted Host. Chicago. A criminal mastermind called Overlord held our city in his terrifying grip. Ordinary cops were losing the battle against Overlord's super freaks and mutants. Then, a miracle happened. When I found him, he had no memory of his past. I helped him find an identity and a life. Now we have a fighting chance. Now we have the dragon. This is the Savage Fincast, the show that pulled up to your house about seven or eight and yelled to the cabbie, yo, home, smell you later. I am Jim Purcell. <laughs> I'm Craig Olson. I'm Raven Perez. And welcome to another episode of the Savage Fincast, the old internet's only Savage Dragon Eric Larson dedicated podcast. We are here for another episode. Uh, this time, of course, we're going to be looking at another issue of Ant, Ant number five, which came out uh, recently in recent memory. I think two weeks ago, at the time of recording. Before the Queen's death. Oh, yes. Let's timestamp it with that. Yep. B.E. Before Elizabeth died, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we got a meaty fucking show, bros. Let's, uh, how about we hop right into that news? All right. Uh, first bit of news is actually big news. And also, as I recall, news that we've reported on... Uh, I think in our first episode, uh, Savage Dragon Omnibus announced hardcover scheduled for release November 23rd for $39.99. Uh, the official copy reads, how, how is this for a 30th anniversary spectacular? Image Comics is proud to present for the very first time ever a massive hardcover collecting the inaugural miniseries and first eight issues of the Eric Larson's groundbreaking Savage Dragon ongoing series, reprinted in glorious full color for the first time in decades, along with all the extras from the first two trade paperback volumes, and even more on top of that. Savage Dragon The Ultimate Collection Volume 1 is a can't-miss for any burge... <sighs> I hate this word. Burgeoning, burgeoning, burgeoning <laughs> Burgeon. fanatic, looking for an easy way to start this long-running, influential series from the beginning. Also includes an introduction by Robert Kirkman. Collects the Dragon 1-5 through five, and Savage Dragon 1-8 through eight, plus loads of extras. So, yeah. Uh, Savage Dragon Deluxe Hardcover is happening this time for real. It's so, exciting, right? It is exciting, if only because it's been a very long time coming. Um, the biggest challenge with Savage Dragon, of course, for getting new readers into it has always been lack of availability of reprints. I mean, you have the trades... But uh, a but lot of them, not really. a, a lot of them have been, a lot of them, I believe, were printed a long time ago, and if they are yeah. still available, they are old uh, copies. And I know from experience, some of those had pretty, pretty lousy uh, binding. Binding, yeah. I and have even, the hard covers, but they came out so long ago. And and, and it, it, go ahead. I'm saying well, I was they're just missing say. a gap. Yeah, the gap. Well, the, the gap. The, well, say. the gap. But the gap is all is the biggest problem. But and the unfortunate truth is, this is just the first volume of a series. <sighs> eh, 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 here's hoping that it solves the gap problem. I it mean, does he? I, w I actually left that off. I'm sorry. He addressed that. He said those missing pages have been recolored to match the originals. Oh, oh, oh. I thought you were talking about the, the parts of Savage Dragon that have not been reprinted at all. That's what I'm talking about. The gap meaning uh, he, he skipped to go to the Savage world. Right. So what Raven's talking about is for a long time there's been a hurdle in the in the potential reprinting in color of the Savage Dragon miniseries and early issues because at the time they were they, they were colored digitally in a out of out of date format that just can't be used anymore. Uh, so those pages w needed to be gone back and recolored, uh, presumably as close to the original as possible, which of course takes time, money, etc. That that sounds like that has finally been taken care of. 
which means That's that what he said that these hardcovers can now be oversized. You could reprint the previous stuff based on, uh, I guess, uh, scans of the original art, but you couldn't do oversized because you would see the artifacting of the stretching of the image. All right. I presume. So now, now you can use the original, you know, color files and it will look good in a larger format. My it's big, exciting. my, my big, I mean, it's exciting, but my big concern will always be, you need about 20 of these. Are we going to get that far? Yeah. I sure fucking hope so. I, uh, I'm a little disappointed in the issue numbers. I, I understand in a way you want to keep the price point low, but I, I like my Marvel omnibus and I like having 30 or 40 issues. I don't, I don't really want like a well, volume of you know, well, 20 volumes. I'd rather right. keep it down. These are identical, I think, in size and length to the Invincible Deluxe hardcovers. Uh, of course, not the Ultimate Collections, which, of course, collect uh, 50 issues of crack. Um, if these were omni- if these were omnibus size, they'd probably cost $100 is another big factor. Uh, if you throw, you know, 25, 50 issues in a book. Who the also, fuck is really also, reading also, this? They're also unwieldy. You need your yeah. own, you need your own lectern to use them. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I'm fine with mine. I don't really need one, but I just you know if you look at it, you're gonna pay forty bucks for what fifteen issues. So well, I mean, sa- it all a, sa- a savvy consumer will not pay that much. No, I'm just saying it's either gonna hit you in the pocket now or later. I'd just rather them be collected in larger volumes, just for the sake of storage uh, and stuff. Uh, I but. agree. I th- what is this? Uh, three. Uh, well, I guess five plus eight, thirteen. Yeah, thirteen issues is fine, but thirteen issues of crack is only gonna get you. I'd have to do the math on it, but. Whereas I'll put. Let me let me fucking give you another perspective on this, if I may. We've been doing the daily but, reread. But basically, it's two hardcovers for every archives. Is what it basically boils down to. I, I let me allow me, if I may, to throw a different view on this. We've been doing the daily reread. Sure, I've been discovering these thirty-year-old image comics that I had. Some of them are unfortunately in much more terrible shape than I fucking imagined. Some of the early issues were only available in newsprint. They didn't have a quality stock at the time at Image. They only had newsprint. Those issues look like fucking shit. Ah. So. I've got stuff that's 30 years old in my collection that has gotten fucking creases and like, you know, at the time I was sharing my comics and people were putting big fucking thumbprints on shit and it just, they look like trash. And somehow one of the damn issues got water damage. I'm just saying 30 years of comic collecting fucking blows rather than having to hunt down out of back issue bins, which is fun but it's also a gamble. You're not guaranteed to get quality. And again, when you're talking about those earliest issues, there's no hope of getting glossy stock. They were in newsprint. So they're going to look like 30 year old comics. So even the, even the direct sales ones weren't glossy stock. It wasn't just the, the um, newsstand ones. So far as I can tell, I mean, I have been looking and looking and looking for some glossy stock copies of some of the earliest issues like the Jimbo one and stuff, they appear to only exist in newsprint. Yeah, so, right. so here's the deal. Is the price point maybe a bitter pill for someone like us to swallow? You know, we've got dupes of some of these. We've bought them in hardcover or soft cover. We've bought the, you know, black and white, you know, archive editions. The idea of paying another 40 bucks, I get where we're coming from. But god damn, dude, to get new people. No, to... yeah, I get it. This is this is my issue with it. Like I want them, but say to reach 250 issues, if you're putting 15 say 15 comics in a volume, you're talking 16, 17 volumes to get to 250. If you put 40 in a volume, you're talking 6 or 7 volumes, which is much more I don't know. It's just unwieldy with that many volumes. You know what I mean? I just like, I just want to see it get to uh, what was it? I think it was either whatever the whatever issues. I think you're reading them right now, or even in your daily, the Image United uh, or World Tour, not World Tour, or the World Tour. Yeah, I think there's there's basically a gap between. See, it's, it's weird because there was a there was an early gap from somewhere in the early '50s to Savage World in '75. 
But then after the Savage World one came out, there was another gap that went, it goes all the way to World Tour. And that's, oh, Lord. that's the gap that needs, to be, that needs to be made available to people because there are way... Well, we keep saying this. You can get all of Savage Dragon reprinted in the archives. But for some reason, people think color is important. I don't <laughs> understand it either. I get it. But for some people, they need color. <laughs> And there are no color reprints for a good 50-issue chunk of Savage Dragon. And in addition to that, in the later issues, you get into low print run books, which the scalpers have entered the goddamn scene. And it's right. like 80 bucks for an issue mm -hmm. that cost three ninety nine two months ago. It's yeah, just like the, the big fear for me is that we're retreading already worn space in these early parts of the run. And that for it won't find the audience as a result. I mean, the problem with that, I mean, you're, I, you're, I agree. I mean, the problem with that is that where do you start if not the beginning? As it yeah, is. Just, well, you're right, right. Just, you have to. I, I yeah. don't, yeah, because, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm a crazy I'm person. So what, what, with, what, I, with, what I would do is I would start, I would put out two at a time, and I'd have one be the, the first one, chronological, and have the second mm -hmm. one be the current one. Malcolm, then, the Malcolm then, era? Right. Hell yes. That's a good plan. If and you then can, you, then you, then you kind of my work, head, though. Then you kind of work backwards to fill in the middle. I'm just scratching my head on why why so little per collection. It's, it's not just, the, to me... Uh, it's actually not that little. It, it, it's, it varies by company, but basically... Bear with me. But you're going to, I think you're going to run out of people going to run out of steam by like volume 10. Like how long is it going to print? All, is he going to put one of these out every other month? I mean, uh, he's you know. probably going to put them out every six months because these things are pricey. Right. Well, by the time you get to anything that's, you know, you figure the first 75 issues are pretty common and easy to get to. Now, except for those spawn but crossovers. The, They've the been people, a bitch. The comics that people want for Savage Dragon, where it starts to get low, is like after 150. I feel like that's the hard ones to get, and it's like. But the, I don't but, know. but trade to paper, me, it's but just trade paperbacks exist of that though. Those are not hard to get if you read trades. Yeah, I get it, but people, if they're just going to start collecting and this is coming out, they're not going to buy the trades now. They're going to just want to jump into this. I just don't, it, it just seems like a lot of volume and a lot of uh, a lot of volumes and a lot of risk that way, whereas if I knew you were going to get to, you know, I don't know. right I feel, up to date I feel with six it, it volumes. Would, I feel like it would be riskier to have a 25 or 50 issue omnibus for like $100. But omnibuses like fly off the shelves now. People go crazy for them. I know maybe not everybody, but I don't know. They've got like this they thing. Also, I feel like they do go crazy for them, but they also sell out immediately, and you can then no longer buy them. Whereas this will remain on a shelf, presumably, well, for a reasonable amount of time. Because they only do one print runs of the Omnibus stuff, or at least they seem well, to. Well, you're DC. talking like Marvel, but that, I mean, this is Image. If Eric wants to, I mean, he's he can reprint as many as he wants. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that that's a problem, right? I mean, who's just because Marvel doesn't reprint them doesn't mean Image can't. It's just for to, to just my vague understanding of how this works is trade paperbacks cover about six issues. Um, sometimes you'll put out a, a middle another trade paperback that'll reprint two trade paperbacks, and then you have the deluxe hard covers, which generally reprint about thirteen to fifteen. Then you have your omnibuses, which can be as up many as fifty issues depending on length. And, and is this is this sold as an omnibus or are they no. calling this? Well, oh, right. no, this is, a this, this is not an omnibus. This is a deluxe hardcover. Gotcha. Yeah, my bad. I threw the word omnibus yeah. in there it, irresponsibly. It, it, deluxe hardcover to me implies oversized. The big selling yeah. point here is that this is bigger than a comic, than a standard comic book. So you get the art bigger as well as 13 issues. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, well, we, I wish, I wish it was an omnibus, but beggars can't be choosers or whatever. <laughs> Um, anyway, I do think it's worth noting that we have kind of seen a glimpse of some of the supplemental material he's including, and it is uh, similar to what you find in Ant. It's his sketchy stuff, right? Which he used to do in the in a lot of his 
trades in the beginning and his collected stuff and then stopped and made it kind of minimal. But, but if you remember like the first five or six, maybe more, they all had like cool behind the scenes stuff. Mm-hmm. So just a cool little, just a cool little extra there. Yeah. I hope it succeeds. I really do. Um, yeah, me too. I mean, I mean uh, it, it, they're going to be this very similar to the image deluxe hardcovers. I mean, sorry, did I say image? I meant invincible. Invincible. Or, yeah. So that that's what you should be visualizing when you think about these things. Because in- Invincible has regular trades, it has deluxe hardcovers, and it has those big paper bu- paperback omnibuses. Uh, I guess it's, a, it's I, a good I, sign. I, I, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. There is a middle ground here that I, I, I think would be better. My favorite reprints right now are the $30 Marvel Epic collections, which have like 25 issues and a paperback. Those like things are book like a phone book. Those things are, those things lay pretty flat. I was surprised to discover there's a lot of issues in them and they only cost like 30 bucks. Yeah. I, I, but they're not oversized. So there's, there's that wrinkle to it too. Well, the good news is that they're even doing this, which means that they think there's a support there to do it after, you know, years of kind of holding off. And right. I mean, you can see it in the market with the back issues, kind of the way they're all jacked up and people are going out of their minds trying to find them. It, also, um, I guess they're promoting this as part of the 30th anniversary as well. So it's good to get some representation in there for, for Savage Dragon. Uh, Allow me to also say that with Kirkman doing the introduction, I can only pray that Kirkman is in Eric's ear, basically telling him. And I remember Kirkman saying this about Walking Dead and Invincible. He said, my goal is to make sure anybody can read my comic in any format they choose. Right. So... And as you know, Invincible is available in every single format. Single issues, graphic novels, hardcovers, omnibuses, compendiums. So it's like, if this does good, Papa Kirkman's whispering in Eric's ear, maybe we'll get that giant 50-issue collection and then of I'll Dragon. 23 versions of Savage Dragon number one. <laughs> Just saying. Moving <laughs> right along... So our next item is a uh, sort of a news item, sort of a brief micro discussion, micro review. Uh, It is a very slim connection to Savage Dragon, but there is a Savage Dragon connection. Uh, Jim Valentino, image founder, celebrated Image's 30th anniversary by publishing The Last Shadowhawk. And we're here to talk to you briefly about that, just how very little it actually has to do with Savage Dragon. (laughs) There's just not much to say, but uh, he's on the cover. That's number one. One of the covers, because there were six. Yeah, I think. he's on. One, like he's that. on one of the covers. It's the dragon you know and love, Chicago Cop. And then uh, in the issue, there's a double page spread that is essentially full of nothing but nods to the Image universe. Right. And so you have nods to Pit, nods to Spawn. Wild cats are actually cats. I thought that was fucking hilarious. And there's a big green finned guy, Fangs, you know, Fangs, Finn. It's, He's it's, obviously I, ha- I haven't read it, but this is so baffling. It's weird. That why, he make, just, why make analogs? It, is he decoupling himself from Image? Well, I could see well, where he would... Well, the Wildcats, right? Oh, I could see... Well, it, yeah, exactly. It makes sense for Wildcats and Youngblood and stuff pit. you can't use and Pit and stuff you can't use. But Spawn? Why? Why allude to spawn when you've got spawn on the cover maybe he found it annoying he had to do it at all so might as well do everybody just in case still it's just a weird choice it was weird is it the whole thing is and craig you can speak on this too because you read it we're just going to spoil a shit out of it sorry dear listener if you care maybe skip well, ahead it's been out for a while now right yeah but this is a weird ass story and uh in it essentially uh, it's, it reads quick as hell. You're going to read it in under two minutes. Guarantee it. There's very little meat on the bones. And uh, it's almost all like splash pages. Yeah. Like double page spreads. And uh, it's just about fucking Shadowhawk gets beat to death by the child of one of the guys whose back he broke. Right. Kid grows up, spends his whole life seeking revenge, training for this day. Just beat Shadowhawk to fucking death. And Shadowhawk has 
apparently a pantheon of Egyptian gods. And they tell them, they're like, well, you know, no problem. You can resurrect if you want to, though. You have to want it. And he's like, nah, I'm fucking tired. Time to die. And just fucking dies. <laughs> That's the end. <laughs> I'm, I don't, like, I'm missing a little bit of his, like, story. Because I remember at Image United, like, a kid, like, inherited the powers. Like, the old... Shadowhawk that had AIDS or whatever, he kind of passed the mantle on to like a young kid, but I don't know what happened. Friend of the show, so. Matt Hickman, told me that what happened is after that kid's adventures and stories occurred, the original backbreaking Shadowhawk was resurrected. Oh. And so the apparently the Shadowhawk that is in Last Shadowhawk is the original shadow right which makes sense because he's the spine breaker in this yep so that's it and the villain is not anybody apparently that matters he just knew he's just made up (laughs) it's weird i actually like that the art was good and i think it takes balls to just you know like you see how people celebrated the 30th anniversary in different ways and valentino's like yeah uh happy anniversary uh fucking Shadowhawk just gets beat to death and fucking quits. <laughs> and for that, as I finished it, as I turned the last page and I was like, God damn, is that it? That's it. I was like, huh, he got me. And so I have to give it to him. And uh, it ends with a gallery of Shadowhawk stuff full of awesome artists. Uh, Sinkevich is in there. You know, there's a bunch of guys, a bunch of cool artists that do backups for this. If that sounded appealing to you at all, pick it up. It's just one issue. <laughs> What'd you think, Craig? What were your feelings on it? Uh, uh, it was okay. It, it seemed like, again, like every page was a splash. It seems so unnecessary. Like to me, it's like, all right, you're gonna make this the last issue of Shadowhawk or the last Shadowhawk. It seemed like it should have been a little more substantial, but. It's all right. I mean, it, it wasn't the best thing I read. Far from it, but. I was, I think you brought up a good point on how it ended was pretty surprising and kind of nice in a way because it wasn't a clean ending and it kind of suited a character like that who was a pretty vicious anti-hero. But uh, I don't know. If you're not a major, major fan of Shadowhawk, I'd say pass on this. There is no real Savage Dragon connection in it if you're buying it just because of the cover appearance. Um, I don't know. It was okay. If I'll agree once with that. Once I read it, I, knowing it, I was like, eh, I don't know. I don't you know, think I, I compl- probably wouldn't have bought it if I knew it was going to be like that, but it, it was an interesting story. I think you, as a sav- from a Savage Dragon viewpoint, you'd have to be a pretty diehard Savage Dragon fan to actually care about this. He's not even really in it. Not yeah. really. I uh, I liked it just for the fact that I was in on the ground floor of the image, and so it's kind of cool just to revisit the character that you don't really see much. The art is pretty, you know, it's it's nice art. It's just sparse with yep. all the double pages, um, and just kind of ends weird but cool. <laughs> so all right, I bought it. I mean, not my best purchase, but it was okay. It entertained me. It was a slow week for me too. That's why I picked it up. But it ended up being surprising, so I was like, all right. So you're not, I take it you are not getting the 3D version? No, hell no. <laughs> he said hell no. Well, I don't know. Why, you know? I was joking, because I, I knew you wouldn't. <laughs> it just seemed weird to me, like, why? Like, if you're going to do it, put it out at the same time and give someone the choice to, right. for me to buy this and then buy it again just because it's 3D, like, I don't know. Also, can you imagine that story in 3D? Like, you're just seeing fucking, like, Shadowhawk's blood flying off the page and shit. Yeah, <laughs> As he gets the hell beat out of him. I mean, maybe if if I had the choice in the beginning, maybe I would buy that versus the original. But since I already bought the original, I don't want to pay for the whole exact thing again just to see it in 3D. Fair, fair. And I, yeah, I don't know. The whole analog like image character guys. I don't understand that at all. <laughs> yeah. It should have t- I mean, like, honestly, here's the crazy thing is they were on the fucking cover, even bad rock. It's like, even the legally sticky characters were on the cover. 
Yeah. So it's like, how did that work? Yeah, I I, rem- I remember back when the image was first solicited. I actually asked Valentino on Facebook how he got Bad Rock on the cover when Liefeld doesn't own him anymore, and I guess he he said something along the lines of, "Oh, we took care of it." Uh, whatever legalese, whoever he had to talk to, at least that was the implication. And it was like Ro- Scott Rosenberg. Mm, okay, I mean, you, I mean, he's on the cover, and no one's saying boo. So, but then he's not in the issue, and it, it's just weird, super weird. <laughs> Moving along. All right, what do we got next? Uh, the image exclamation point thirtieth and thirtieth uh, anthology series, which is these oversized uh, books celebrating thirty years of image. We're on issue five is the most recent issue that came out. Uh, this one features uh, a Tim Seeley story, uh, which is has his characters uh, the hack slash characters, um, and in this series, it appears that they're going to be interacting with some image characters of past um it's called uh was it something about your heroes sorry i don't have it in front of me it uh, wasn't in the copy i apologize okay I'll, i'm gonna look it up right give me a second it's called hack slash kill your idols and this is part one in in the fifth an- anthology issue um, and for Savage Dragon completionists, this issue is worth checking out because this story does feature a character that uh, you will recognize, and it seems like this character is going to be integral to the story. So um, I would say uh, check it out. You know, issue five. I don't want to spoil anything more than that, but the Image 30th Anthology, if you're a Savage Dragon fan, you might want to pick this up. Kill Cat's in it. What's that? Kill cat. I said kill kill cat's in it. It's Melvin Mouse. Come on. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, that's it for the news, baby. Let's jump into the emails. Wow, we did. In lieu of any sound effects on this podcast, <laughs> you I ah uh, the old interesting conversation. Last issue was, who would you like to see Ant cross over with? Since we're getting all this hot Spawn and Malcolm Dragon crossover action. So, I'm going to jump right in with our legendary letter hack, Mr. Sotiris Gravis, who says, Hey there, guys. I was going to send in a letter sooner, but life got in the way. Regarding which Savage Dragon character I would never want to see lose their life, it would have to be Maxine. As for this nymphomaniac, oddly enough, in French, orgasm is petite mort. That is to say, little death. With regard to who I'd want to see really die, that would be the Seeker. Only it's revealed that he can keep dying and come back to life like Kinney in South Park. But decides to never return because he sucks at his job. Sincerely, Sotiris Gravis. P.S. What would bother you guys more? Larson deciding to retire his Josh Icon Greg, or bidding adieu to John Day forever in a day. PPS. I'd like Jim to give us updates now and then on which action figure acquisitions he's made, as well as the ones he's lusting after, real or imagined. Keep us appraised, goddammit! PPPS. Great seeing that Raven letter in Ant number four, but depriving us of patented Perez sexed up fan art was a little ant climactic. See what I did there? P-B-B-B-B-B-B-B-B-B-S. <laughs> Craig, as for a team-ups, visually it doesn't get better than Daredevil. Seemingly a fellow set of mascus wearing a color-coordinated full-body condom who'd look great at a Met Gala. Sadly, unlike the mature rating of Savage Dragon and Super Freaks, Ant is designated Teen Plus. Translation, no sideways monkey mouth, monkey pox action anytime soon. Right. As for his question, what's going to bug you guys more? Um, Seeing John Day leave or Icorn? John Day for me. I, w- I would Ooh. miss the mustachioed man. <laughs> That's a tough one, man. I'll go with Icorn. I, I like uh, reading the latest put down. 
Yeah, I'd be more upset to see Icorn go because I feel like John Day is always sort of inconsequential, you know? Whereas I do look forward to those insults. Until that one day he's not. Don't say it, dude. He's not going to pull a Queen Elizabeth he's on us. It's been Fonte the whole time. <laughs> Josh Icorn is Fonte. <laughs> Um, Jim, do you have any action figure uh, updates oh, for Satyrus? Oh, Raven. This is a Pandora's <laughs> box you're opening. Keep it concise. We got big letters to get through. Uh, Make well, it. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start counting my head to 30. Go. Okay. Well, just today I got um, a big uh, transforming uh, Dinobot sludge from the uh, current Transformers line. He's a big boy. Unfortunately, he's got very loose legs, which is kind of a pain in the ass. Because I like keeping him in robot mode. And uh, if I don't support him, he falls over. Which uh, The other t- the other two Dinobots I have, uh, Slug and Grimlock, they don't do have that problem. Um, what else did I get? That's 30 I, seconds. Tough shit. I paid $50 <laughs> for a Baroness uh, in the new uh, G.I. Joe um, uh, classified line. The one that comes with a motorcycle. Which really sucks because I don't want the motorcycle. I just want the Baroness figure. I don't like very many G.I. Joes, but... Baroness is one of the better ones. Sexy. Uh, indeed. Uh, I think I'm going to e- e- eBay the uh, accessories that I don't want. See how that goes. Yeah, dude. Uh, right now, though, the, the one figure I'm desperately looking for on store shelves is the Mira- uh, Ninja Turtles Mirage style Casey Jones. Uh, mm-hmm. I know some people don't like that particular figure because it's a little off model from the comics, but I don't care. I think it looks great. And I... Mm-hmm prefer these Mirage style uh, figures from NECA. Mm-hmm. Other than that, I have a list as long as my arm I could go down, but I'm not going to. Folks, I've seen his arms. They're like orangutan's arms. You really don't want them. <laughs> they drag past his knees. As for dream action figures, uh, actually, what figure did I want? God damn it, I had something. Now it's gone. We'll come back to that. <laughs> Bring it up in the middle of Tony M's letter. All right, you want to go to Tony M? Let's do it, dude. All right, this one's from our boy Tony M. Hello, gentlemen. Here's my reply to last episode's interesting conversation. I got to go with Geiger. Yeah, it was a short series, six issues, I believe. But I can see Ant meeting Tariq Geiger, I think that's his name, in the post-apocalyptic irradiated... Nevada desert. Heck, you can throw in giant mutated rat ants, some Mad Max type roving mutant hordes on motorcycles, and a double fisted dash of Geiger's Escrima glow sticks, and you'll have more stick action than you can handle. <laughs> I can see this crossover being seamless as Ant is in the pre apocalypse and Geiger is in the post apocalypse. Mm. Figure out a way to cross their timelines over, and boom, you've got your team up. It would be awesome to see Gary Frank's more realistic take on Ant. Anyway, thanks for your hard work. The last few casts have been great. Try to pump out more of those retros and let's maybe see some quiz action make a return. Those are pretty effing funny. Peace out. Tony Michelandra. And I have to say, Tony, hopefully you get this before you hear this podcast, but I did send out your copy of Super Freaks that I promised. It took me a month, but... It's out there, so keep an eye out. I had to think for a second to remember who Geiger was because uh, I had forgotten I read that series. Geiger's got a great look. I'll be honest, mm-hmm. I didn't think the series the series didn't light my world on fire the way I hoped, to be mm-hmm. honest. But Geiger looks great. Great great design. Eric did a, a cool cover, too, for Geiger. He did. He Geiger. did, yes. So um, is Geiger I, the skeleton with glow bones? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. him. Cool. Uh, there, there's additional spinoff series, uh, well, one shots and such coming out soon. Mm-hmm. Um, right, that robot guy. Uh, yeah, the... robot Joe, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> and he had like some kind of annual that came out or something. Yeah, I hope. Yeah. Uh, I, I I like those like cohesive universes, so I hope it works out and we get more different characters from the same universe. Those are always kind of fun. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of like uh, he's kind of doing a mini version of what's going on with Radiant Black. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I think that that's neat. Uh, I don't mind buying the other books because it's like almost feels like uh, instead of just getting a book a month, you're getting like you know multiple books a month because it's all set in the same same universe. 
Cool. Um, but I think that's a good point. I, I was like ants trying to like deal with, you know, the Illuminati and the apocalypse. There could be some kind of way to merge those where she, you know, either Geiger falls into our timeline or she yeah. goes into his, which like Geiger Tony said, ha- probably more interesting for her to go into his. Geiger is one of those titles that's team up problematic because he's kind of integral to his setting and there might be more space for, uh, for like other superhero stuff, but it's, it's really far removed from your typical superhero universe. Yeah. I mean, it definitely could make something work out for an issue, even if it, you know, who knows anything can happen. It's comics. Yeah. If that Nancy and hell and Malcolm dragon crossover was as good as it was, there's no reason Geiger and Ant couldn't also be fantastic. All right. Should we move on to our next? All right. Well, one last thing. Real quick, you two. Flash question. Do Gary Frank's occasional crazy eyes that he puts on his characters bother you? Uh, (laughs) We talked about this, I think, didn't we? I think we have, yeah. I can't remember what in context, though. Over the last 10 years, I'm uh, sure we did. but Off the mic. Yeah, it might have been off mic. I'm okay with it because I kind of get what he's going for. Um, he's like, he's got this like semi-realistic cartoon style, and it kind of is pronounced, especially when he does crazy face. Mm-hmm. But I kind of like it. It's kind of his signature move. I honestly didn't even notice until Raven pointed it out, and now he ruined comics for me. Oh, well, that's what he does. <laughs> you Thanks, never noticed. Wah, you never. Wah. You never notice the crazy face before. I, 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 I often wonder if it's more down to the colorist creating a, like too detailed skin tone that really makes it like stand out. I don't know. For the listener, if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, it's impossible to just Google it. But if you Google Gary Frank crazy face, I swear to God, you'll you'll find results. I promise you. All right, moving along. I don't want to oh, slow the also, show. Also, we gotta we we do have to pump out another quiz or something at some point. Those are fun. We have thirtieth anniversary quiz. <laughs> I've been doing the rereads. Uh-oh. I have some. Yeah, have dude, some... you got all that fresh memory. Yes, dude. Ask me fucking old shit. I won't remember, but I, at least I'll have a good reason. <laughs> he won't have a good reason. You just read through it. No, my good reason will be, oh, God damn it! I just read that. <laughs> That's not We're, a good reason. <laughs> well, like before, remember I had those weird, like I'd read every single issue, but like it just was so bizarre. And dude, I'm yeah. telling you, this reread has blown my fucking mind for how some of this shit connects. It's insane. All right. Sorry. 30th anniversary quiz, Tony. It's coming. All right. Matt Hickman writes, hey, guys, Matt Hickman here. Love the show, as always. Uh, as for what ant crossover I'd like to see, let's see I'd like to see a hack slash or atomic robo team up. Uh, they would be cool, I think. At first glance, they don't have a lot in common, but Casey uh, Hack and Atomic Robo have both fought Illuminati-like groups, so there's your in. Uh, well, we got the hack slash crossover potentially happening uh, as we speak, so check that out uh, if you so... Uh, that's what not you're sure into. It would be with Ant, though, but... Sorry, what? Not sure the crossover would happen with Ant. Oh, We don't know yeah, that. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, this is about Ant, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I could see... Uh, yeah, I could see Hex Slash crossing over with Ant, because they do they do have similar, in, if you think about it, similar premise I. Yep. Is premise I a word? No, nope. I just made it up on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not busting your balls. It sounded great. The Illuminati uh, and Premise Eye. At- At- Atomic <laughs> Robo has a lot of uh, similarities to Hellboy, so another decent pick um, in that regard. Yeah. I'm not yeah. a big fan. I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of Atomic Robo. I know he's pretty popular. Um, I've never read any, but I've. I know. I know it. I could tell you yeah. if I saw it. Same. Pe- uh, people love it, but I've it never do. read it. Yeah, it's 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 fine. I, I'm just not as super into it as I thought I would be. In what way did it fail you? Well, it was just comes across as Hellboy Light, I guess. So oh, I felt like I, re- I felt like I read it before. You know what? Proof, Hellboy Light. Remember the comic Proof with like a Bigfoot as the main yes. character? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. To is Hellboy that Riley Light, Rossimo, or who was that? 
It's just, I'm saying the criticism Hellboy Light is such yeah. a valid criticism. My God. There were so many, dude. Yep. Yeah. Ro- Robo fights Nazis and... I mean, he's... Superhero X-Files. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, basically superhero <laughs> X Files stuff. Yeah. Goddamn I mean, superhero X Files. I mean, I basically <laughs> I only read like the first trade paperback. Maybe it evolves beyond there, but based on that, it was not 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 to uh, not to uh, um, shit all over Atomic Robo. Yeah, not to shit on your pick, Matt. Sorry. <laughs> all right, let's let's get. We got a big letter next, so yeah, we got a beefy this, boy. So, so. meat and potatoes. Yeah, we got a beefy boy, so I hope you listeners are ready for my micro machine impression. Micro machine man. <laughs> Ancient millennials got that one. All right, here goes. Get ready. <clears throat> Hello, Craig, Jim, and Raven. I hope you gentlemen are doing well. See what I did there? Oh, wait. God damn. Hold on. <laughs> that was a good one. I hope you gentlemen and Raven are doing well. See what I did there? You fucker. All right. I wanted to thank you for reading my letter in a previous episode and weigh in with my answer to the ant finteresting conversation and my opinion and feelings on getting and reading previous ant issues of going in cold. First, what character would I like to see ant team up with or would to appear in? I have two. Before Hulu gave us the new Predator movie, I read a novel called If It Bleeds that came out in 2017. It's a collection of short stories by multiple authors about predators in different times and worlds. I'd love to see Ant being hunted by this savage Schwarzenegger slasher. It could be about uh, hunting a huge monster-like villain, only to have Ant show up, defeat it, and leave just as fast, making her a more worthy prey. Then Ant and Gadget Man have to figure out what is hunting them while the monster-like creature is also hunting Ant. Ant's antenna could find a predator tech, her suit could block her heat signature, and so on. Plus, the deciding factor of an Eric Larson drawing a predator, which would be fucking awesome. That was my editorializing there. <laughs> um, so, that would rock. My other choice, speaking of others, classic brain-eating, tongue-wagging, lots of slobber, Venom. I love Kate's Venom run, but this would be OG Larson Venom. Uh, Venom hears about another bug-like hero who'd have another symbiote and goes looking for Ant. After finding her and determining her suit is not a symbiote, he uh, decides to let her go, but a rogue government group shows up to catch her. Instead of helping, Venom just stands there giving tips and pointers on how to fight multiple opponents like a, opponents like a dad or a mentor. Uh, when the fight is over, she yells at him for not helping and uh, asks what she knows about her suit venom tells her before he leaves it's not our place bug you have to discover that on your own or you'll never learn sorry for the long answer you can shorten it if you want it is your podcast we chose not to concerning reading the back issues are going in cold i think it would be better if eric just did his own thing Back when Eric announced he was purchasing Ant to create more of the comic, the only people who would have been interested are fans of Ant or fans of Eric, who would be curious why he wanted this character. Do their due diligence and read or purchase Ant to see for themselves. So, most Ant purchasers are probably bored with this Ant recap. Yes, Eric did make a nice little challenge for himself with the issue 12 trap, but I feel it would have been better to finish the current storyline and start something new. I uh, bought Ant's back issues, started reading them, but they seem all over the place, and so I stopped. <laughs> so I am going in cold. But after finding out Eric's just reused most of the panels and stuff, I feel kind of cheated. That's my opinion. It doesn't really matter because it is Eric Larson, and I'm still buying it. Till next time, Finn friends, thank you, and sorry for the long letter. Thrawn, I stumbled a few times, but don't worry, big guy. We got you. Yeah, so, I mean, that seems typical, like, trying to read those old issues. They just kind of peter out. I don't know. It, they're hard to get through. The old Ant issues. Yeah. There's Speaking to a product of their time, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking to this crossover choices, uh, goddamn, dude, throwing good picks. Eric drawing a Predator would be absolutely fantastic. And, of course, we know he could do Venom. So that would be a visual feast as well. That would so, be cool, like some kind of crossover with Ant and Venom or something like that. Dude, the symbiote comparison? Mm, that's good stuff. Um, yeah, the, the those old Ant issues are not decidedly serviceable. They are less than <laughs> decidedly serviceable. Well, they can't all oh. be. Yeah. 
Um, speaking of not decidedly serviceable, boy, have we got an f- interesting conversation topic for you listeners. The new question. I'm going to open it up. I'm going to ask Jim and Craig, and then I'll just prattle off my short answer. Dear listener, did the original crossover issues or this crossover encourage you to pick up Spawn? If you did, are you still collecting? If you didn't, why weren't you encouraged to pick up Spawn? Gentlemen, you have the floor. <laughs> no. The only, <laughs> the only reason I read Spawn at all was because Eric was writing and drawing it. Um, mm-hmm. And that this crossover happened during that period of time. And the moment Eric left, I left with him because, oh boy, I did take a peek at the very next issue after Eric's and whoa, it was not good. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I did the same. Like I picked it up for Eric and then I forgot to take it off my pull list. And then I, I ended up buying like four or five issues Oops. after that and then finally pulled it off my list. It just, if, correct me, I don't remember. I just remember, I think it went back to like very realistic looking. Yes. In turn, like almost photorealistic. I can't stand that. I can't stand comics that just are almost like Fumati. Or what was, is that what it's called? Those like. I think you're right. I if, it's not no Fumati, if it's not Fumati, it's Fumetti. One of Something the two. like that. I mean, but it, it was almost like, like, yeah, just photos. It was almost it was like someone just took it and put it through a Photoshop filter or something. I don't know. This was not good. The point was, uh, and, uh, it was just not good. No. I mean, I have peeked at the newer issues. I mean, obviously Spawn in the last year has it's, kind of exploded with cl- all those new comics and stuff. Yeah. Clearly something is going on with all the different titles. And so I think I, um, I begrudgingly admit some of the action figures look cool. I, but that's I always like the direction case. he's going in, though, with the newer ones, and I think that's part of the reason why. Like, it seems like he's going back to like the superhero stuff and bringing back those characters from the nineties. Well, the real question is, they, did they bring fun. what's her name back to life yet? Uh, the I wife, Wanda. Oh, Wanda. Oh goddamn! And the one thing Eric did was kill her, and I feel like enough time has passed. It. And the way uh, McFarlane tends to regurgitate the past, that that can't possibly have remained permanent. But I would be yeah. like to find out if that if that's still the case. I, I got to say, the comic looks a lot more fun from what I've seen compared to what I've read in the past and seen in the past. Like it seems like I'll agree with he's that. Kind of letting it more let, let its superhero flag fly a little more than just dark brooding in the shadows type thing. Yeah, I'll, ag- I'll agree know. with that. At a distance, this new direction, give the devil his due. I mean, the thing is, is McFarlane is a super savvy businessman. Uh, nobody could ever take that away from him. You know, he's got King Spawn, uh, Gunslinger Spawn, Scorch. Uh, he's got all these things, plus the original ongoing Spawn title. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's still yet new Spawn st- like spinoffs. Plus, you got Spawn versus Batman, like part two coming up with Greg Capullo on the art. I mean, so he's doing a lot of fantastic stuff right now. But I mean, no, I had this same similar story to Craig. I Eric pulled out kind of abruptly, so I kind of didn't have the ability to cancel it. So I kind of got a couple of issues past Eric's run and uh, I didn't like it. And so... I don't know, even though the new stuff does look cool or whatever, I mean, I'm spending every comic dollar I have right now. And the thought of buying, like, that's the only thing I have is as fun. Like, the only problem I have is as fun as it looks, all this stuff he's doing with, like, you know, Scorched and King Spawn and Gunslinger Spawn, this, like, team of spawns. Um, I don't know. Just, I, I just don't find Spawn a fun character. Like, it looks fun, but from everything I've read in the past, like, it just feels like a downer of a comic every time I pick it up and read it. Like, it just, I don't know. Like, I'm not, like, I'm, like, not excited to read it. Yeah, he doesn't crack jokes. He doesn't seem like a guy that's going to make you laugh. Or end up in a funny situation, really. Yeah, he is a weird character like that, right? He's not a very likable character. I mean... It's funny not to spoil, not to spoil some meat and potatoes, but like, 
I went and compared the way Eric wrote Spawn in this issue to the way Todd went back and rewrote Spawn. Right. Todd Todd writes Spawn like a dickhead. <laughs> Eric actually made Spawn nicer and more chill in this ant issue than Spawn was written by Todd himself in the original right. crossover. So How, it's weird. So what's your so what's the consensus? We all draw we all picked it up. Drop you, Jim. You dropped it immediately. Right. I I I, I, stuck I, I, a little bit. I only stuck around for the Eric Lit issues. I ac- I did the exact same thing as you, Craig. I accidentally didn't pull it off my list in time, so I got three or four issues, and it's real bad for me to toss a comic in the trash. But I, I just I threw them in the trash. I was like, eh, I don't. Wow. Ever, I'm never gonna read these. So uh, yeah, write in. Let us know, listener. Uh, let us know if we're wrong. You know, should we have not done it, or why you feel any differently, or did you feel the same as us, or whatever it is. We'd like to hear your story on if. You picked up those initial spawn issues that Eric did and, and stuck around afterwards. Um, you can let us know at uh, savagefincast at gmail.com. And uh, if you don't like this topic, suggest your own. We're all also open to new topics. Again, uh, savagefincast at gmail.com. Gentlemen? Yes, Raven. We've been... Fair. This has been a front-loaded plate of hors d'oeuvres. I don't even know if we've got room for meat and potatoes, but I'm going to choke it down. I think it's time for meat and potatoes. Ant number gotta five. Make room for it. Yeah, I've got to make room. Dude, hold on. I'll be right back. <laughs> time to get that my tongue. That didn't taunts. sound real. <laughs> hold, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ant number five, monstrous on the cover. Listen, you, you you like her. I like her. She's a good character design, and the blueness of her goes so good against the redness of Ant. See, okay, that I agree with. I mean, I think she's a good design. I just I don't find her as exciting as you do. Um, I think a villain who monsterizes good guys is inherently interesting in that you have the potential to see a cool character design. Like, Monster Malcolm looks cool. Does he? I think. I, I, again, I kind of look at Monster Malcolm and go, oh, right, remember when Bud Ugly got injected with Chosen One blood? <laughs> <laughs> well. Or remember when, didn't Malcolm turn into the same thing with, uh, what's it, another character? Uh, he was a little bit more extreme in that case when he got poisoned yeah. by the water supply. Oh, no, wait, was that She-Dragon? Of course, he was, he got it was poisoned She-Dragon too. too. It, was, it was both of them. I can't remember what yeah. Malcolm looked like. Yeah. I might he did have sort of a monstrous look there. Yeah. Yeah. Belco Chemicals. I don't remember you guys being, don't like... being, I don't remember being as extreme as She-Dragon's transformation. You guys don't like uh, Monstrous? No, I told you I like monsters. I'm not as excited about her as you are. <laughs> yeah, I'm indifferent. Wow. I think we're going to hear that a lot from you, this issue. <laughs> uh, now, I, w- I will say I really like how the, the, the composition of this co- cover uh, makes all the uh, the rando monsters black and white to make all mm-hmm. your colored heroes and villains pop. Yes, dude. This is a very good good cover. Yeah. Eric. Eric on the colors. And shout outs to Eric for goddamn making Spawn's cape red. Right. I forgot about that. Did we mention that? We Someone mentioned that late recently. And I can't remember if we did on the podcast or not. And I was like, I forgot until I went back and prepped for this podcast and looked. Same. Like, oh, yeah. That's right. He did try to make it look like a, his cape. Try to make it look like a trench coat, right? Yes. And then when you see it colored red in this issue, it is so obviously not a fucking trench coat. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even realize that was a thing. Yeah. And so, was... so I went back and reread, and the way McFarlane wrote the dialogue is that Spawn couldn't even manifest his full costume. Right. He was in that black... Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure the, the suit was just a costume, right? It wasn't even like his... Uh, powers, right? Right. 
and then it grows. Like as the issues go on, it grows. Right. But Eric clearly wanted to just draw Spawn. Right. Oh, so he changed all the capes <laughs> into brown trench coats. Yeah, huh. it was just color. The cape was just colored brown in the Spawn issues. Oh, it was obviously now, okay. A cape. Now I remember. In fact, I remember from I think the previous ant issue in the sewer. Yes. <laughs> I think it was brown in that issue. Let me double check that because I'm curious now. Yes, it is a brown Dude, trench coat in that issue. It's like when in 1960s Batman, Cesar Romero just painted over his mustache. Right. And and hope nobody would notice. Well, That's well, how it was. What I'm saying, though, is it was a brown trench coat in Ant number f- three. Three. So Spawn has a red cape on the cover, but in the issue, Eric colored his trench coat brown. Because he had a trench coat for obvious in issue three, but now he has a red cape in issue five. Yeah. So he, he has grown his cape back in the time that has passed. Uh, it just was, it really, what's funny is my takeaway from this is it really gets to showcase like kind of like the meddling Todd did. Yeah. Because even some of the uh, Maxine and Malcolm dialogue is just so much more natural here. When it's not been tinkered with by Todd. Right. And then you go back and you read this same scene when Todd was like, you know, tweaking this and that. And it's funny because it just reads a little more awkward. Like, it's just a little more weird and unnatural. And I'm looking now back at Spawn issue 266 where many of these... uh panels and spreads come from and he does in fact have a brown cape in that issue so the recolor is new for this issue joker stash he just fucking painted right over it (laughs) maybe if i make the cape brown they'll think it's a trench coat well my main (laughs) my main primary writing concern of uh, mcfarland's is and always has been his heavy reliance on fucking caption boxes yes just put it on everything. Everyone gets a caption box. You get a caption box. <laughs> and he it's the cardinal sin. Every rookie comic artist knows that you don't have extraneous caption boxes. You don't have them there if they're not doing something. Right. And McFarlane loves to be like plaster like front uh, like let's look at the front page of this issue, Ant number 5. We gain new information from the caption boxes. Hannah, if you read the original scene, appeared very much to be knocked out. Right. Eric Eric uses the caption boxes to have us know that she's just laying there listening. And it's like, that's a little bit of a funny thing because it's it's clever, actually, to me. Because it makes it to where it's like, well, Aunt didn't 100% trust what was going on. So by laying there unconscious, she could kind of hear Malcolm, you know, Malcolm's unfiltered opinion of the situation, right? So it kind of adds a new wrinkle that you didn't get in the original thing. But that's when a narration box is working properly. It adds to a scene by giving you information that dialogue can't do. And so it's just so funny how, to me, the big takeaway from this issue, even though it's a whole bunch of retread, was just Eric getting to show off how these sequences and stuff were supposed to go. I don't know. That's my take. What do you guys think? I mean, that's no, the agree. idea, right? That's how I feel. You think, you think it's a little confusing for some, re, you know, opening this first page and seeing the, you know, the dragon kids so s- small. They're like all in cribs. It's weird, huh? This is six years ago that this originally was print. This story was originally printed. Max even even almost makes a point to say you have three kids. Like Maddie hasn't even been born yet. True. This I don't panel know if is it's... interesting because uh, this originally, so just for the listener, if you're not in the know and you're, you're kind of new to this, most of this issue minus four pages is all from Spawn 266, right? Yes. There's about four pages that had like spawn content that Eric replaced at the end of the book with gadget man uh, pages. 
But uh, this page was actually a half a panel when it originally appeared. And Eric looks like he kind of re-inked it and uh, made it a full page. Yeah, there's a sort of a decompression of this scene. Like, you get a little more Maxine and Malcolm, which I fucking, in this year 2022 of our starved, you know, dragon-starved reading, I'll take all of it I can get. (laughs) What are your thoughts overall? I mean, I know we'll go more page by page, but seeing as many pages being reused as they were were you expecting that was that something i i was expecting it because that was made clear pretty early on that was part of the goal um it's basically use the pages the way eric intended rather than Mm -hmm. having being covered in mcfarlane inks i think was part of it i didn't expect him to reuse as many pages because after the last issue i expected I initially expected that when I first heard him talking about it, but then the last issue he didn't use as many pages as I thought he would. But then coming to this issue is back to what I really initially thought it would be like, and I wasn't too thrilled about it. I mean, I feel like I already bought this comic. Yeah, you did. Uh Yeah, a lot of it's very similar. Now with with fewer caption boxes. (laughs) So um, for you, it's not much of a thrill or not enough of a thrill. Um, just for those listeners who maybe forgot, McFarlane's inks were digital. So this is actually the way the art originally was drawn by Eric, more or less. But let's be real. I mean, I feel like McFarlane didn't add that much to it. This oh, stuff in Spawn is at- still loose. I mean, it's definitely different, but... It's not like he went that over. The stuff in Spawn was still really loose. I don't know. I put them side by side, and it's, it is thick to me. Yeah, he went nuts where he went nuts, and he left some stuff clean. I, I think it's interesting. Um, so, but I mean, yeah, I get he, it. Like, he, he left the, the, the pages where, Dra- or where Malcolm and Maxine and Ant are in their apartment, mostly alone with you know minor embellishes. Mm-hmm. But once the action gets going... It seems to be a lot more, although it, it, it's possible, it's the coloring that makes it seem like it's been cranked up so much. I mean, I definitely see his inks on it, but they're not, like, he left a lot of stuff pretty loose. Well, I mean, the most important thing, though, is that, like, you just were not thrilled by, like, the, you know, the art wasn't doing it for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, I I was not a big fan of this crossover initially. It is cool, Mm -hmm. and I'll probably listen to the podcast that we recorded originally and probably was all gung-ho liking it, but I don't know. (laughs) I I don't know. I'm not the biggest fan of the Spawn character. Ant hasn't impressed me much. I just want to be, like I said last podcast, like I just kind of want to get through this, like I I'm not enjoying the series as much as I would hope. And on top of that, just rehashing stuff I've already read and wasn't the biggest fan of in the first place. It's not a good mix for me. Like, I just want to get through this and start new stuff. I want new Larson characters. I don't want Spawn. Spawn's not a draw for me. I understand why it might be a good idea to have Spawn in your comic um, to attract new readers. Mm-hmm. But he's not a draw for me. I just, you know, I would rather, actually would rather no dragon and no spawn and just focus on Ant. Like, I'm, it's too early in the series for me for too many crossovers. And like I said, on top of it, something that's basically I've read already doesn't help. Let me ask, what do you think about um, both of you, actually? Uh, what do you think? But, Craig, you can lead if you want. What do you think about sort of the uh, continuity doctoring Eric's doing where he says that uh, this Savage Dragon Ant Spawn crossover took place simultaneously with the cold burn incident where Ant loses her hand? Like we know in real world, real time, those were actually printed, comics printed at very different times, right? I mean, Mario Goli's Ant... Was yeah, Mario, that was done 
for a while yeah. before that, that crossover came out. So that was um, kind of a shocker to me that he's like, yeah, she's like, yeah, you know, the reason why I couldn't meet Spawn was I was getting my fucking ha- ass handed to me by Coldburn. And I'm just like, huh, that's a big crunch of time right it there. It makes sense, though, because it's like... What are you gonna do? Make this real time? Because then it should be like, oh, you know what I mean? Like it was, yeah. still, it was probably ten years, you know. Yeah. So we were kind of talking about that. See, I get you, Craig. I just want to say, dude, listen, I totally understand. Because was I jumping out of my fucking skin to read this <laughs> stuff I've read before? No. And sadly, I have to look at this objectively as a reviewer and say that I don't think most people are gonna be thrilled with this. I am interested in it because I think that there's interesting things and problem solving happening, right? Like he's retconning, when he tells this story, he's retconning stuff. So for instance, in order to see the scene with Malcolm and Maxine, we have to have a reason for Ant to have witnessed it. Because as we saw, when Coldburn in Mind Drain, she was fighting him, she got knocked out and woke up, and there was just that abrupt transition. So technically, there should be no reason for Ant to know what Malcolm and Maxine said while she was unconscious. But a clever little twist of the writing, and all of a sudden, Hannah's laying on the table pretending to be knocked out so that she can sort of find out what's going on, right? And yeah. to me, that's interesting, but I can, I can see where to a lot of readers, well, they just wouldn't give a fuck. Sometimes, like, Eric's an enigma to me because I feel like he really tries to fix things in comics, even if it's to the detriment of sales. Like, he wants to, like, make this all fit neat and perfectly. But then there's other times when Eric's just like, you know, we can skip all this. It's not important. Let's just get to comics in action, you know? And it's like, it's, sometimes it's hard to figure, like, is this the same guy? Like, to me, <laughs> you know, you would think of this personality, he wouldn't worry too much about trying to fix this and make this so cohesive based on another, you know, creator's version of things. So it just frustrates me that he's spending all this time to try to make it all fit when I would have just been as happy just to start over, you know, same character with same powers, but just give it a kind of a soft reboot. And I think it would have done this comic so much more service. Jim, I'll ask you the same thing. What do you think about the problem solving of basically jumping the Mario Goli stuff up into the like what was spun Malcolm Ant published in like 2014 or something? It was a lot more recent no. than Ant. What's what? Wait, what? What are you saying? Is 2014? When Spawn, Ant, and Malcolm uh, cross yeah, over. 2016. 2016. All right. So it's like two years off. But, Jim, what do you think about the problem solving there of having the Mario Goli stuff like jumped up from the 90s into like 2016? Uh, Unnecessary well, or cool? I, I think it's, I think it was necessary to do what Eric's trying to do here. Mm-hmm. I mean, very clearly the timeline's screwy if you think too hard about it, which I have done several times in previous <laughs> episodes. Right. Because it's very clear that Hana's military t- service time was supposed to take place during the Second Gulf War uh, after mm-hmm. 9-11. Uh, and if that is the case, then the time dilation between that, her appear, uh, her apparent age... And this crossover with real time Malcolm uh, Mm -hmm. just doesn't work. I think we have to basically go on the assumption of a a sliding time scale on uh, Hana's part. Uh And she is now effectively ageless. Uh, Any war she may or may not have fought in being more nebulous, non defined conflicts. I think he's just treating it as like time in Iraq right now at this point, like just well. Well, that's what I'm saying is that it, like it, it doesn't it, have from to the, be after the, 9/11. The, the, well, no, it has to be. It can't well, possibly it, be the first Gulf War. She'd be forty. No, years I'm old. saying I'm saying it doesn't have to be right after. What I mean, like it could. But be I'm saying ba- I'm saying based on the timing of the original Ant series, which was a post, you know, a mid two thousand series. 
it was very clear to me that it was intended to be post 9-11, second Gulf War, invasion of Iraq. And if that's still the case in this book, it wasn't clearly defined, which I suppose is there to fudge the timeline. Right. But yeah, I thought that can, was the intent. He can play with that and just, it doesn't have to be, you know, it could be fighting terrorism or, or whatever. And that's what I'm saying. Point. That is what Eric has done. Where right, you what, have to, there's this, you can't go back that far. She'd be like five years old. Right. Well, that, moving past wasn't necessary because you clearly you do think it's necessary. I mean, how did did you feel like would you have preferred he just not mess with it, or did you like the the? To me, it's kind of a cool stunt, but did you care or did it make you feel anything at all? <laughs> Craig didn't like it. Like Craig wants well, to I, move I mean, on. Ask you this question: Like, why you guys feel like were you guys opposed to just a reboot of the character? Oh no! Like, why I do would, we need to like keep I would, all absolutely. This story? I, I absolutely anyway. want how, a reboot. How do I explain this? I would have had no, I would have had, I have, my lack of interest in Ant means both options are, were about the same. Mm-hmm. Clearly, this is what Eric wants. He didn't want to do the, the, the clean reboot. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. now we have to live with that decision. <laughs> well, yeah, we do, but it just means... I, me, I, at least, it's I not don't, enjoyable. we, I can't assume that a whole new original ant series would be any better than what we're getting. But what, so Why you're saying, you, you're basically saying no preference. You had no preference. I had no preference. My you, preference actually all, would have been for the all, clean reboot, Craig. All I know is that wishing for the clean reboot seems folly because he has made it clear ever since he bought the character and used the character in Savage Dragon that he wants to retain the stuff he finds interesting about Gully's aunt and, you know, get rid of the stuff that a, he doesn't own and B, he See, doesn't really care for. Based that on was his, that I've was, read, that was his goal from the beginning. Everything I've read, what he finds interesting in Ant is the look and the powers of the character. And I, all I've ever heard him do is shit on like how all over the place, he doesn't like was and how bad he, it was where she started out as just like imagining everything uh, as a child. It, see, it seemed to me that her, the imaginary stuff is what he liked the least. And that's the stuff he's gotten rid of. Right. Or he or, just gave a page or two or he recontextualized it as like a, something else, a child's crayon drawing. But yeah, I just don't get it. I just, like you said, maybe it's just fun for him to try to, put this puzzle together and try you know maybe it's more for him that he's like yeah. he's trying to make this work this but i do think it's not good for the book <laughs> i think i I've, I've explained my point of view on this before this book as it exists now exists the way it does so that eric can publish a ant book a complete ant graphic novel where he would not be able to do that with the gully uh the gully series because so many pieces are uh, not owned by him. And again, I just, I wouldn't want, like, if obviously I'm not him, but if I'm putting together a graphic novel, I don't want this my stuff connected to the gully stuff, because it's not good. And everyone you talk to is like, yeah, I got through, like, three or four issues, and I stopped, you know? Like, people that are willing to go back and buy the back issues, you know, we just read a letter, which is very similar to my experience. So if I'm Eric, I'm like, I like the character. I like the design. The story stunk before, you know, he he got on it. It's all over the place. It's not good. Why why keep it around? But anyway, I'm not going to keep beating this dead horse. No, dude, it's reason. fine. Like, here's the thing is, like, I'm, I'm interested. Uh, let me just say that, like, I am enjoying the ride because I like Eric's art. I'm enjoying the challenge because this is a retcon. Anytime you go into retcon writing, oh boy, you're stepping in shit. And I think he even stepped in a little bit of shit in this issue. We'll talk about it when we get there. Not a ton, nothing big. But Just it even... sort of created an awkward bit of dialogue in an old dragon issue. But like, this is the thing. As much as I am enjoying the art and as much as I am enjoying the experiment, because I read Savage Dragon for the experiments, and yeah. to me as a comic artist, this is incredibly interesting. However, in my heart of hearts, what do I really want? 
I would love to see Eric just fucking cut loose, do something new, and just fill it with like cool new mon- the cool new bad guy designs. Give her a rogues gallery as cool as the one that Dragon had, and Dude, just that, like blo- opening splash and like the first issue with all those like Batman esque character things. Yes, yeah. When I saw that, I was like, "Ooh, this is gonna be cool!" And then you know they were a fantasy, and I was like, "God damn it!" Wow, I, 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 I with- thought they were pretty lame. I'll be honest, the, co- the creation of a child. <laughs> so <laughs> insulting. Um, take that, Bob Kane. Bob, Fuck Bob. you, Bill Finger. <laughs> um, um, I just, I agree I'm, with you, I'm Raven, just saying, though, I, the, I, I, I'm with you, with, dude. With the experiment, I do find that interesting. I like, I liked holding this up to the original Spawn issues and seeing his approach on like knockouts and coloring and. Right. For I me, that's like a thrill. That. I do like the fact that, you know, the main characters, you know, get all the nice kind of glossy coloring and effects, whereas the the background characters get the flat and the, and the, the different kind of bright knockouts and stuff. It's, it's fun. It's interesting. But I don't know if it's enough for me. I got to say, think... I am legitimately shocked that I'm the one who's got to stand this series. No, dude, listen, I'm enjoying it, too. Like, it's weird. I feel like a fence rider because I'm saying that, like, I kind of see where Craig's coming from. But also, I am enjoying this because to me, up until these issues, which actually these issues are still fresh in my mind, right? Um, Up until these issues, the old ant stuff was still hitting my head as new. So, like, when I'm seeing... You know, Gadget Man put Coldburn's tooth in a fucking fountain pen. That's awesome. I actually fucking love that. I thought that was cool as shit. But then I didn't have a head full of the old stuff. So I had that benefit, whereas Craig doesn't. Craig read the old stuff. So for me, I kind of am like the fence sitter. Like I see both sides. I am enjoying it. But if I had my rathers, I would rather see new stuff. Um,. Not to labor it too much more. Like, like, yo, can we give at least this double page spread with Monstrous on the right hand, Spawn Ant and Malcolm on the left, Spawn with his properly red cape? That's pretty badass, right? Yeah, I liked it the first time I saw it. I like it now. <laughs> I will I, say that I I, love... I, I I do think the coloring here is a lot better than the previous if because it doesn't look like soup. I will say that the fucking, I think that the coloring in this issue is some of the best coloring modern ant has had. I think Eric's getting kind of like way more bold. Right. And I think some of these like design choices, like the palettes for Malcolm and like just making monstrous, just pink, all these hands, all these different colors, you know, the, the panel where the second one's Brock and Malcolm's like, bam, I bet you felt that, that top panel where it's like all the different colors of hands and like the heroes are just flat yellows. I don't know, dude, to me, I wanted to say the coloring in this issue was like fucking 10 out of 10. Yep. I can agree with that. That, Yeah. uh, I liked it everywhere except for the double splash. Which one? Brown, the army of Brown Brown villains. I feel like it works really well with the background characters, but when you have a double page splash, it doesn't work as well for the, at least the, the, like when you compare this to the spawn for the double page splash, Mm -hmm. I'm not as much of a fan, but I like it in all the other smaller panels. I could see that. Um, let's see. The the, the page directly after the double page, the magenta Malcolm. That looks really good. Yes. And the fucking like purple rocks flying out with the yellow rim light on the uh, guy he's punching. Yeah. Ooh, I think that's what I'm saying is I feel like it's hard for me to like come down on this entirely because I feel like Eric as a colorist is just fucking going berserk with this. Yeah. You don't see this in any other modern comic. No. I mean, that's the thing is like. It's like a lost art of like these knockouts and stuff that like really makes sense for a comic book. Uh, you see this in Cobra. I would say one comic. Well, here's what's so funny. That new Alex Ross, fantastic four. Yeah. That's got some of it going on too. Well, people are losing their minds over the fact that fact that it's flat shaded. 
And I'm just like, bro, reading it. Like, goddamn. Well, it's like that's f- because he's just trying to be Kirby, you know? I mean, that's right. where a lot of this comes from. 60s Marvel comics, you know? But it's on this sweet, glossy paper with, like, modern printing. You can hit palettes that old printing never fucking could. Yeah. And so, like, the, when I'm looking at this shit, this shit is so... Like, look at the blue on Spawn. Like, across from Malcolm, Magenta Malcolm. Yeah. Like, that blue on Spawn is just fucking Superman blue. And it looks so cool, dude. Well, it's just, you know, the old guys knew what they were doing. And sometimes we just lose that. And when, you know, it just takes something like this to realize, like, you know, this they knew what they were doing. Like, this stuff is good, you know. They, well, they, they, they the had to know what they were doing because they had a lot more limit, limit, limitations. Yeah. yeah. They fucking rose past the limitations. But, God damn, it looks good. I think the coloring in this with like a lot of these, all right, like even just like there's just cool. It's weird. It's, it's almost like the coloring is even like surpassing the fucking art at times. Like when monstrous, when monstrous kisses Malcolm, like the way the panel like goes from like sort of yellow orange to like red to like, it's just straight on red and his pupils red. Yeah. It's awesome, man. (laughs) Right. Or just the green sky, even on the bottom of that page, the green sky behind Ant right. really pops. Well, even look at the next page with Ant flipping around, and the, the sky is a different color on every panel. It's like wait, wait, wait you're talking what, what, what page are you talking about? You're talking about the one where it's like uh, Krathum at the top. Yeah, Thurkum then Hack. All right, so we I need to talk about this three panel sequence. Okay. Because this is my favorite fucking thing comics can do. Yeah, baby. With, you have Monstrous in the front in a fixed position, her arm Mm -hmm. in one panel, her half her head in the middle, and the rest of it in the right. And you have the repeating background of the the side of the building while also having Ant doing her gymnastics routine over these moving bad guys. Mm -hmm. This is fucking great. I love this shit. I wish Eric did this more. Sell speed. It sure do. Yeah, I really like that sequence too. Is this new? I don't I think so. Like... No, it was re- it was used. But here's the thing: I was looking at the comparison just because uh, the coloring on the previous issue, I think, impacted mm-hmm. my, uh, uh, you know, because on the on the on the Spawn version, uh, the the first of all, the sky is the same color in every panel. Second of all, the same color as all, all all the goons yeah. are blue, and Monstrous yeah. is also blue. Yeah, so I hated that. Does not read as well at a glance. Plus, if I'm looking at a page from that same crossover, and normally I love textures, I normally have no problem with textures, but when every single thing has a texture on it, it just becomes mud. And these flats really show how you can just pop something out. Did you guys notice how much, when you look at the the Spawn comic, how much ink, like how much like McFarlane just covered up Spawn? Like, like you look at that the same page we've been looking at, and you look. I don't know if you guys mm-hmm. have it with you. So we're talking about we're talking about the page with uh, when that um, you like with the three panels. If you look at the panel below it and the McFarlane version, he right. just covers Spawn is just a black blob basically. <laughs> yes. And you and you see that as well. Remember the the panel where you're talking about the Superman blue? Yeah. If you go back to it, you'll see he's completely blobbed up black as well. Yeah. In the Spawn issue. There's a heavy-handed inker technique called when in doubt black it out. Oh. And that was like a what, what, who was who was the inker on Kirby that did all the Thor issues? Uh, oh, I don't know. I'm Kirby ignorant. That's a that's a Craig question. He he just ruined all of Kirby's war, like pens like a race shit and like black shit out. Uh, he's notorious. I can't think of his name. Right, uh, Vince Coletta. If you look at all the original pencils for Thor and then look at what Vince Coletta like inked, he just turned everything like super scratchy, got rid of all the details. <laughs> it's funny. It's sad, but but that's what I see in some of this McFarlane ink. <laughs> when in doubt, black it out, baby. That's just cheap. <laughs> it's a cheap trick, and the reason it works is because the uh, human eye 
is uh, geared towards value. It even like even like you know sort of prioritizes value and contrast over color. Right. And so the more black you have, the more things your eye likes it like the more finished a page will look the more but obviously eric's going for the complete opposite thing with this sort of like uh you know french open line technique Mm -hmm. so he's not going to be blacking a bunch of shit out so it's just it's hilarious that and again that's the comic stuff that i'm eating up like it's like you get a difference between before we were getting a difference between eric and eric traditional and eric on ant now we're getting a difference between goddamn mcfarlane and eric on ant it's it's even more so it's stuff like that is really carrying me through these reused pages because i'm just like it is fun and interesting to sort of just hold it up to the old issue and be like god damn (laughs) this is weird and different so let's stop let's stop talking about what we've already seen and let's talk about what's new Flying car. Spoilers, Raven. Why, why do you gotta? <laughs> I'm gonna build it up. You gotta. <laughs> Sorry, foreplay, not my strength. I just stab right in. Just blowing your load. <laughs> I just stab right in and blow my load. That's you know. Sorry. Dude, As you were. One one thing, real quick, um, because this is kind of boring and something we haven't seen before, and it kind of ties in. Do you guys you notice the big difference between the the um onomatopoeia like lettering that exists in this book but didn't exist at all in the spawn book yeah spawn spawn doesn't do sound effects right right i don't think so and it i mean i think it changes a lot just having that in there yeah yeah you can't disagree. oh my gosh it feels m- way more like superhero let me also add before we jump to gadget man sequence that uh i feel like the sequence of Malcolm telling them to jump up on the building and hide. And then the, the dialogue between ant and spawn is way less antagonistic and way like, like spawn is just way more chill. He's just a more chill guy. And, uh, then, you know, the coast is clear. And so they come down and it's just funny because man, it's just, it's it's almost like a director's cut. Like there are things that like Eric went to the lengths to show that kind of like it just feels like it makes more sense and is more natural than you didn't even realize it was a problem when you're reading Spawn until you read this and then you're just like, yeah, goddamn, why did they just like slink off into the shadows real quick and just come back down? You know, <laughs> I, I do think a lot of this dialogue may have been added just to explain Spawn's power situation. Yeah. Because that wouldn't have been obvious uh, if you hadn't read the original Spawn crossover. Right. About what, what's going on with Spawn. Yeah. I do like the, the new dialogue much better, though. Yeah. Yeah. So much. Good Lord. All right, Jim. It's yours, man. Build it up. <laughs> well, it, well, it's Warm- too late. Too late now. Uh, we Warm get, it up and slide us in, dude. So we get some of Gadget Man's home life, and uh, he's not happy mixing uh, work with pleasure. <laughs> he's got a kid he's got guy and duder uh uh children's books Bed sheets. <laughs> is gadget man's kid gadget boy um <laughs> cowlick kid <laughs> he's a bad parent to give a kid guy and duder sheets yeah that'd be like giving your kid like south park memorabilia <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, the, the mention X flying car is back. Um, are we to assume this is the original? I mean, the one that we're familiar I, with, or is it just, another I don't one? understand that. Do you understand that dialogue? Can you explain that to me? Yeah. He says he, it's pretty clear to me. Yeah. He, he says it was yeah. formerly owned by a certain savage dragon from Chicago. I believe the two of you were acquainted. And he, said, yeah, oh, he yeah. says, Ma- Malcolm says, that's my dad's dimension X flying car. Oh, that's right. So, so, so remember, Dragon, um, Dragon went to Dimension X, got stuck yeah. there for a year. Uh, Freak Force came and got him, and I think they grabbed a flying car on the way out. Yep. And, and so, yeah, that's right. You just read all this shit. You would know this. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, the during the family era, they had a fantastic car. 
Yeah. Uh, I think didn't Universal like slap it out of the air? Um, they used it in that fight, but it didn't get destroyed at that point. Like I, I can't remember when it, how it got lost. Well, I, I, assu- I assumed it got destroyed, but I guess not. It blown to bits in one thirteen. Let's take a look here. So, real so, quick. It w- so it was blown to bits. Oh, you guys says, chat, oh, and I'll find it. You're talking like you know, but it's actually down here in this box that I missed. But see, see, <laughs> this is where I was confused. It says that's Dad's Dimension X flying car, and he says right. it was, and then it says Dragon's car was blown to bits in Savage Dragon one thirteen. So how is it if it was blown to bits? Because Gadget Man's a Gadget Man. Oh, he well, fixed he, it. Is that what he said? He I'm saying it's disintegrated. Well, his dialogue, he says right there, that's funny that that's throwing you for a loop, you guys, because in his dialogue, he says it was pretty destroyed. He had to guess and fix it. And so it's like Gadget Man repaired a car from another dimension. Like, the reason why I think this kind of kicks ass is that fucking it shows Gadget Man is smart enough to have fixed fucking, like, technology from another dimension. (laughs) Yeah, he even says that he fabricated some of the pieces he needed. Ah, uh, yeah. I guess I just missed that. But this sort of explains what how they get to uh, get the, to Mexico, right? Yeah, yeah it's because that, that's, that's never actually shown. I think they just kind of show. <laughs> well, up. in two seventeen, it starts off with kind of like a splash with like an explosion behind them, and they jump out. So you don't see the car; you just see oh, them landing. oh no, the flying and... car is not long for this world. Yeah. It just, uh, it's like smoldering, but you can't tell what it was. It's just and, wreckage. And then here's my thing. This is where I think he stepped in just a tiny bit of poop yeah, with this retcon. Yeah, I know going to say here. So I found the, I went back and I read that. And uh, in issue 217, mm-hmm. it, Malcolm and Ant and uh, Spawn are all in a panel. And Malcolm says, that flying car of his sure was cool. Hope he had good insurance. And it's kind of like, at this point, he's referring to it as his dad's car. So to me, it just hit my ear a little weird, you know? It's kind of like some Star Wars type retcon stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, because it was his dad's car, but now it's Gadget Man's car. I know, so re- but the way he references re- it. It's just a little weird. I do like the fact they reference the fact that Malcolm has flown a flying car and has familiarity with it and the fact that flying cars are easy to fly because children can do it. Yeah, that dialogue was brilliant. A kid can fly this thing. I was like, oh, that's good. That's good dialogue. Yeah, it was a neat little retcon. And it's crazy when you go back and you look at those spawn issues (laughs) that the flying car is referenced in that one panel. But like Craig said, you never get a good look at it, ever. It's just like when you first see them in Mexico, there's an explosion and it's a double page spread of all three of them being thrown from an explosion. And that explosion was the flying car. (laughs) And then there's one more panel where it's just on the ground and it's just like, you know, scribbles, it's a heap. So it's not recognizable as anything that you would recognize. So it's just kind of a funny little... And they reference Gadget Man, who was just kind of out of the blue referenced, right? Like, yeah, there was no visual. That, it was like, yeah. no, yeah, I was like, oh, Gadget. It's like, who the hell is this Gadget Man, dude? My Unless mind. You read the original. Well, Ants, well, that's right. G- Gadget Man was a character in the original Ant. So if you have familiarity with that, you know who Gadget Man was. I recall at right. the time we were kind of get grasping at straws, trying to guess what yeah. this Gadget Man was like. Uh, right. In my mind, I thought he was like like a wizard. Like a fucking, just a like, really old dude. Huh. Well, I thought a he was, wizard. I imagine him as like a launch pad McQuack type. I I imagine him like, um, who was the guy the Punisher had? What was his name? Oh, oh, Microchip. The the, you know, the, yeah. guy, the guy in the van type character. Yeah, that's what I envision. Yeah, that I too. Also, I also envision, in fact, you know how they're in a van in Mexico? I thought, I bet Gadget Man is just like this fucking dude with a long beard. Like, you know how Blade had Whistler? Yeah, yeah exactly. like just a dude with a really long old beard and a big wrench and goggles. Some guy he, that can't fight anymore, but he can create stuff or something. Yeah, <laughs> right. And then he shows up in this series, and he's just got dick nose, and he's a dad. <laughs> <laughs> dick nose. <laughs> so for me, here's the thing. For me, 
That was a neat little twist. There were two retcons in this that were kind of neat. Three, technically. And it was a neat little car that this was the, uh, a neat little twist that this was the Dimension X flying car. As fate would have it, the daily reread hit perfectly right along this spot. I was just like, oh shit, I just read that. So it was this like crazy timing. So it was neat. It was neat to guys, see the Dimension X car. Did you guys notice the weird, It's I don't wouldn't consider it so much a tangent, but it, it comes off really weird. On the last page, the first panel, how the speech bubbles make uh, Malcolm's fin look really small. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> I do. I do see it. The color saves it. There's that little color triangle up there. <laughs> but I, yeah, I see what you mean. It just hits just right on the segment almost. Poor Eric. We're really raking him over the coals on this one. <laughs> it's okay, um, man. Oh, I, think, I think I think I think there we... is something to be said real quick. These last four pages, of course, would have had to have been drawn in the last few months. Right. And they mesh perfectly with the art he did in 2016. Yep. So, and, and you know he's changed somewhat since because he's always changing. Oh, yeah, constantly. <laughs> so I think the, the matching of styles is impressive. I also do like the ant uh, is like sort of like got the wall crawler Spider-Man like thing going on. Right. In these last four pages. Like she's kind of like just. She does seem a little small on that page with the group shot. Doesn't she seem oh. like a little bit tiny? Oh no, Jim. I wish you hadn't have said that. Yeah. <laughs> even, even, I think the problem is her antennas. Well, there's a couple of problems. Her antennas are in front of Malcolm. And clearly the wall is also in front of Malcolm, which is why she looks so small. I don't know how to, I'm not an artist. I wouldn't know how to fix it. It looks really tiny. It's hard though, because if you put your pinky on Ant's head and then put your pinky on Spawn's head. Right. I mean, there's clearly some measuring off that has been done. Like Ant's not as small as she looks, but for some reason... God damn it, dude. You fucked with my head. I see it too now. What is this? What is this? Well, she's magic? supposed to be closer than Spawn, right? Yeah. Yeah. Spawn's behind Dragon and she's in front of Dragon. Yeah. So she should be bigger than Spawn. Yeah. I think so. Damn, bros. You guys fucked with my head big time. <laughs> Like when I read that, I didn't think anything of it. I was like, "Yep, this is fine." And, and I then, didn't like, it now I I can't unsee it. <laughs> yeah, small ant. You I mean, know I, she I, is. I mean, I guess she's petite. I guess maybe, but not that small. She's insignificant. Ant. <laughs> <sighs> Never gonna end, is it? I hope there's thirty years of this. <laughs> <laughs> any interesting letters i didn't read uh not necessarily i don't want to i don't want to say I can tell that you there's... a letter you didn't read mm. oh wait did you have a letter in here raven no that was last issue yeah i don't see one <laughs> um what do you guys think of like this first cover pass he did on uh the second page of art uh, of sketches. What the, what's going to be uh sort of guide us to it. All right. So you go to the second his, page, the but second, like which, which, which corner panel. All right. Uh, third page of sketchbook pages. I mean, they're both double page spreads. So I uh, top, top, uh, top left, top left. So, okay. Does it have a little sort of like pink ant drawn over it? Uh, no. Next page. Next page after that one. Okay. The one that has the caption says this one actually came pretty close to becoming cover to Ant 5. Yes. This one, this one came pretty close. Oh, that one. Yeah. I like it. I did too. I do too. Yeah. Monstrous front and center. She looks good. But uh, I can see how yeah, Eric thought she looked a little there. awkward. Yeah. I think it's not as dynamic. I mean, she's like pointing. Mm -hmm. but it's not as dynamic as the cover we got to be honest it it might look pointing maybe it would look better if she was like turned away being dismissive 
I don't know. I I think he went with. The, I think it looks good. I think he went with the right choice with like them being all tangled up in the monsters. Like ha- seeing her in from this angle is better than the angle that in the sketch there. I think that's the difference between like an excellent cover artist and s- someone great. Like to see this and be like, wow, it's cool looking, but. I don't know. When you look at the angles and everything, I think he worked it out just right. It looks way better with like a ton of monsters holding them and seeing kind of monstrous in the background instead of the foreground. Right. I could see. Agreed. Yeah. What do you guys think? Now, this is the sweet spot for me where you get the comparison printed right in the issue. Yep. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. You get to see the brown cape opposite right there of the red cape (laughs) it's so crazy dude i see what you mean though craig like if you look at those like bottom panels of malcolm and maxine it's not like mcfarlane went oh like insane embellishing on those no it's like very that whole ant series was very like i was a little disappointed because i thought we were gonna get Larson with with McFarlane inks and he was not I mean you can tell he he did slap some inks on there but he really didn't give it a heavy-handed McFarlane ink which maybe I should be grateful for (laughs) well I will say though when we saw that when we saw that cover of Malcolm you know charging in the tennis shoes that he did as a variant cover for Savage Dragon I will say that's what I had in mind when I heard yeah. that he was going to be drawing over Eric's uh, pencils. I feel like when you look at Eric's pencils, there were more like Giffen layouts for McFarlane, but McFarlane just kind of inked the layouts. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And maybe that's the way it was supposed to be, but really the pencils are so loose that it feels like McFarlane was supposed to do more than he did. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Absolutely. You guys uh, know, I'm surprised Raven didn't mention on, on the sketch pages, the second page, how many of those, like that first panel and the and the third panel, just the VJJ shots for the cover. Yeah, or dude. Splash or whatever <laughs> it is. I got to say, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Man, I mean, that is like dead center. Like that is like your point of focus. Basically. <laughs> it's like a little much. <laughs> I feel like the struggle with ant, like, and it's so crazy. Cause there's been camel toe and like erect nipples and stuff in this run. And yet it's supposed to be like teen, whereas savage dragons <laughs> mature. And I'm just yeah. like, this is a skin Dude, tight. Look suit. at the, the first pay, the first, uh, page on that on page two the first panel i guess Mm -hmm. that's like a portal to another dimension (laughs) look at the look at the like the focus right on it's like you cannot avert like you know exactly where you're supposed to look and (laughs) it looks like a portal uh (laughs) in indubitably you spared me having to be the one to point it out (laughs) She's no, I love it. I love it. I, I think it's a crazy challenge to make this book not be mature because it's just like, not that there is anything inherently sexual about a naked body or even the nude form. It not really. But the funny thing is, is you know that's how people take it. You know, you know, people see it and just go, "God damn, it's a vagina!" Right in my <laughs> face, I can smell it. Woof. And it's just like. And well, yet, especially but, with that pose. I mean, that's yeah. like over the top. Yeah, man. That's <laughs> that's mirrors on your shoes pose. Like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's know. cool that, I mean, honestly, he's given us a peek into, you know, anyone would do that. He's throwing things together, see how it looks. Yeah. yeah it's cool that he's, I, I really enjoy these kind of extra pages in the back. Would you guys prefer this or the strip? Like a, a a new like backup strip or something. I'm ready personally, just me. I'm ready for backups. Yeah. Ant centric. 
Yeah, if it was ant centric, I would say. But if it was just kind of like funnies, like in the the, the Savage Dragon book that weren't related, I think I'm kind of cool with seeing some of these like process pages. Correct. Yeah, to me, if it had like, if we were like, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, counting in real time. If it was six more pages of ant centric comics, fuck yes. Are you kidding me? I would eat that up. Even if it was something stupid like, let's just check in with fucking, you know, like there's a throwaway line where Coldburn's like, dudes, don't come here. Like, Coldburn is still after me. Like, you know, you guys stick out like a sore thumb. Like, goddamn. Even if you just had like six pages of like just, you know, Gadget Man, you know, trying to throw the swerve and throw off Coldburn or something like that. Just a little. Or we got so little of Alzea Stone. Yeah. If you just use these six pages to fucking give that guy like 10% more character and motivation. Like, so at this point, I'm ready. I, I And this is hard because I do love this sketch stuff. But at this point, I'll take six pages of new stuff, especially with as much retread as we've had. Comics, yeah. comics, comics, comics. You know, what about you, Jim? I mean, I'm always down for more comics. I just, I wouldn't think it's very realistic to expect comic backups in this comic. Well, he did just ask my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see why not, though. Like, like especially, like, look at this issue. I mean, how much work did Eric really have to put into it? Ooh, that's a... It was already... I mean, I'm just saying, it was already, like, drawn, basically. Four new pages. That's an evening for him. I guess. I feel like the coloring probably took a lot more work than that. Than implied. Yeah. Oh. As someone who hates coloring, that is a very real factor. God damn, that's a real factor. I mean, well, I mean, I mean it's, I mean, it's, entire, it's, it's very likely we got it so fast after issue four because the art was already done. But, but I wouldn't say it was probably, you know, easy. Don't forget, though, Mike Torres is doing the flat still. So how is much is, is Eric really doing? The, the characters that kind of pop out. I mean, I didn't know that. that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tor- Taurus is still credited as flat, so I would. Yeah. So he's doing ninety percent or eighty percent of the the coloring. I gotta assume, right? Because most of the stuff is flats. Let's be real. Can we be real about something? If there wasn't, if I'm this all- wasn't a year, oh, dude, it's about shit's about to get fucking three D. Like the listeners are gonna 3D like chess. Fuck, yeah, we're going to emerge from their podcast radio or whatever the fuck. <laughs> if you're jogging on the treadmill, make way. We're about to jog beside you. Dude, if this wasn't a year where we only got two issues of Savage Dragon, I bet we wouldn't have the same, we need new, we need new, as bad. Yeah. Like, if 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 Savage Dragon was doing the heavy lifting and Ant was just a nice bonus... I bet it wouldn't sting quite so bad to have this like retread period that we're sort of going through. And sure. so I just have to say that we may not care so much down the road. I think it's a moment in time that we're living through where we've only had two issues in like <laughs> nine months. So there's always that you always got to, you know, take all the factors in, you know, when you're talking about something, I feel like poor ant is kind of bearing the brunt where ants, the new Larson stuff that we're getting in 2022. Sure. I, I, I mean, I hear, here's, it's, here's the rub. I feel like I've seen reasonably positive reaction to ant from non dragon readers. Mm-hmm. Now I can't tell you where I heard that. It just feels like that. good i mean i want this book to succeed like yeah, god too, damn obviously. i want this thing to fucking win i would i wish it was an easy way to get more uh man on the street opinions about ant because we're a pretty you, insular group do you want me to get out there and do the work yeah put the put the mic in the face is i'll, I'll hit the street well all you have to do is look at how many ask your comic shop how many people 
have it on their pull list. That would give you a good indication, right? Yeah. I will I will say that the Facebook group that the Savage Fincast uh you know is per- a lot of us are Fincast finheads are like participating in um mm-hmm. those ant threads they they don't pull in the comments. I know that. But then again to Jim's point that's largely dragon readers, you know. Right, right. Well, I mean, I hope people do like this comic honestly. I mean, I can't I can just tell you how I feel, honestly, and I'm yeah. not going to lie and fake it because, I mean, obviously I'm a huge Eric Larson fan, and I'm sticking with this, and I enjoy the conversation that we have about it, and I enjoy, you know, like, like you said, Raven, the, the experiments and stuff like that. So I'm sticking with this. My hope is that it becomes more to my tastes and liking, and I think, I think once we get through kind of like the period where Eric feels like he's got to tie everything up. I think I'll enjoy it more and more. And, and this is again, a bad issue for me because it's so much of a retread. Yeah. Mostly like 16 pages, but I'm still here. I'm willing. I think like a lot of comics, there's a lot of comics out there too, or I'm like, I don't get fully into it until like five, six issues in, you know, but I think that's only fair to certain comics. Like, you can't just people it's so quick to give up on stuff, you know, and you've got to let that first arc kind of go, you know what I mean? And, and see where it goes before you give up. Cause some, I've had times where I've given up too quickly and I've come back to stuff are, and really liked it. You guys are currently enjoying radiant black and radiant red and I Absolutely. built too quick. Yeah. You know, I totally was like, man, eh, fuck this and got off of it. And now to the people who I totally respect you dudes like opinion on comics. So if you say it's good, I'm like, God damn, I need to give it another try. But uh, yeah, man, it happens. <laughs> you sometimes something doesn't click with you right away and maybe you well, should have given it more time. Well, it's also sometimes those writers are just kind of finding their voice. You know what I mean? Like they're just yep. working things out and things get better, you know? I sometimes do think they get worse. Even though Eric's an old pro, I do think there's some of that on Ant. I think sure. he's problem solving. You know, he's figuring out what he wants to keep, what he wants to lose. And I think we do have a little bit of, you know, problem solving going on here. Like once Ant hits its stride, I have no doubt that this is going to be just another fucking barn burner month after month, you know. We can only hope. Well, so what do you guys think? We got next issue. We do. And I have to say it's the end. Spider-Man writer, artist, Eric Larson concludes the all inspiring ant spawn savage dragon crossover in epic fashion. The trio travel to New Mexico to take on the menace of Alzea stone, a man using his mutant ability to transform zealots and social misfits seeking power into deadly foes. Ant comes with our highest possible recommendation. And it's got Ant staring down a big old crevasse. I love the colors on that with the star field. You know what will make you feel more comfortable? He has blacked out her (laughs) hoo-ha. He blacked it out McFarlane style. He just and covered it up. Eric said, uh, oh, Craig might see this. (laughs) This cover with the end has confused so many readers. Dude, it, again, I hate to pick on poor Eric again, but like <laughs> putting the end on the cover of issue six may have been a terrible mistake because everybody has been like, is this the end? And he's like, no, <laughs> it's not the end. God damn. <laughs> I don't know. It's crazy. Can I say it's it's. Can I just throw this in real quick? That that's a frustrating thing that independent comic creators have to deal with. Like, people will read Ant and they'll see the Ant on the cover. Comic illiteracy? It's the fact that it's that double standard. It's the fact that if they they see a million comics with Spider-Man and Batman, it's like, the end, the the brutal finish, you know, no more, Spider-Man gone, and stuff like that. And nobody thinks that that shit's over. People see like fucking ant number six, the end. And they're like, <gasps> it's like, guys, God damn. <laughs> what 
Will you chill the fuck out and just read Ant number seven? <laughs> so, we're going to indulge in one little last flight of fancy. We're going to leave in a light note. I want you guys to, to gamble. I want you to bet, because we're going to laugh at how wrong we were. Will we get more Isaiah Stone? And if so, I want you to gamble in to what extent. Craig, go. More as in more than... like More than some... what we got in the original, which for the listeners, so... if you forgot, we got very little Isaiah Stone. He's sitting on a throne looking like Shao Kahn, and then he's under rocks. No, he got stabbed, right? He got stabbed through the heart. And then didn't he get covered in rocks? He definitely got covered in rocks. I don't remember how he died. I guess I'll find out next issue. Spawn killed him. Yeah, That's right. Spawn killed him, and Ant and Spawn disappear, and Malcolm Malcolm wakes up. Yeah, Malcolm wakes up, and he's like, fuck me. (laughs) Guess I'm walking home from Mexico. <laughs> I think we might see his hand pop up out of the rubble. Ooh. That's my that's my uh, guess at the end. Like I think we'll see most of the same. Now, now you think do you guys think he's going to do the same or he's going to like basically re So don't don't forget here now. This issue was a savage dragon issue, so Eric basically tackled it the way he wanted. Right. Is is he now just going to adjust it to make it Ant's point of view and change well, the colors? Or is you think we're going to get more, you know, you think it's going to be like just a few or half the pages used or something? I 100% expect four new pages. I mean, sorry, I do. That being said, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. And I'm going to say that I bet we get a bunch of Isaiah Stone information but he does die in the rock pile but it leads somewhere else ant related do you think did he have any like servants or anything just the people he made only only uh brenda not was it brenda funk yeah she got her powers to avenge spoon oh do we see her come back yeah she came back <laughs> raven killed her i killed yeah, her. he chopped her head off <laughs> 225 do you think someone picks up Alzea Stone's mask and becomes the new Alzea Stone? Do you well, think he wait, becomes an ant character? This is like what's interesting, ant-daddy. is Alzea Stone is connected to the biblical rapture. Right. Al- although, to me, it was never satisfactorily explained. Right. And so, to me, there has to, those four new pages in Ant number six, there has to be more about Some him. Some kind of epilogue or something? Yeah. He may not live. I'm going to say he doesn't. You're saying hand up out of the rubble. I'm going to say Eric has too many power broker characters and he lets Alzea Stone die. But it, it's got to lead into new ant stories. It yeah, but those, those are like dragon power broker characters. I say we get letters pages and then an epilogue after the letters page. Freak Force style? Yeah. <laughs> that He's would be fucking that awesome. That would be awesome. Jim. Break your vow of silence. Um, I, I honestly would say no. I I think we'll get the same amount we have now. He'll die, and then Ant will move on to whatever's next. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna be your answer is the most disappointing. I hope I you're know, wrong. I know. That's why I said it. All right, man. Uh, what can I say? I'm a realist. Keeping it real. Keeping it virtual reality. Jim puts the VR goggles on his head and they just explode off. You get to hear me grumble again next podcast. No joy. <laughs> can we, can the world handle three sad Craig episodes in a row? Bitter and jaded. Uh, we might get a Savage Dragon issue in between. You know, we could get lucky. The story of Paul? <laughs> no, no, that issue's months no, out. We gotta, we, gotta get through, we gotta get through the Mako issue first. Oh, Mako. Mako yelling in his face, right. Yeah. Everybody got a birth mint. <laughs> so, 
So should we put this episode to rest? Please put it yeah. to, to bed. All right. D's nuts. <laughs> Remember, write in savagefincast at gmail.com. Well, didn't we forget something? What's that? Uh, next issue solicitations. Jesus. This guy's where, been sleeping. Where were you? Oh. I I read the whole thing. <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, I had to step out to piss, so it was probably that. So, I knew, I knew it. I got here for were... first. Goes sometimes I pee during wow. the podcast. Wow, busted, dude, busted. Just hit that mute button. You don't miss anything important. <laughs> oh, you outed yourself. Train like... wreck of an issue. Train wreck of an episode. <laughs> yeah, it went out perfect. <laughs> Savage you, Fincast, where our own host doesn't even listen. Right. Hit that two uh, hour mark, even I get exhausted. <laughs> That's the name of this issue or episode. You just hit that <laughs> mute button. <laughs> you don't miss a thing. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening, everyone except Jim. <laughs> <laughs>